trashy pulp novels of the world have anything to offer? Are bestsellers all they're hyped up to be? The Terrible Book Club explores whether or not you really can judge a book by its cover or its ridiculous synopsis. If you've ever seen a book and thought, ugh, who's reading this? We probably are. Welcome to another episode of the Terrible Book Club. I'm Chris, and this is Paris, and also another person. <laughs> hey, this is Paris. Hi, I'm Laura. And this is Laura we have today. Um, so, my good friend Laura is joining us today for our reading of Swamplandia by Karen Russell. Um, I did is that... Is that how you're supposed to say it with the exclamation point? <laughs> it has the point? exclamation point. Swamplandia! Are you, are, are you, are you sure it's it? not like a frightened... Like, it's like, uh, yeah, I mean, well, I guess after we read the book, it definitely took on a different tone, but, uh... I, you know, yeah, sure. Yeah, you, you picked a real good one for to have a guest on. For <laughs> yeah, reason. I know, right? Well, we didn't... All right, so Laura's here today to uh, talk to us a little bit about alligator farms, alligator wrestling, and Florida, because um, that's the environment in which Swamplandia takes place. So uh, Swamplandia is about a family who has an alligator farm uh, in Florida in the 10,000 Islands, right? And uh, yes. they do alligator wrestling. Um, they have this big show based on um, the mother of this group, Hilola Big Tree. She's like this fabulous, uh, you know, beautiful woman who dives off of, uh, you know, this, this huge ladder into the alligator pit and swims safely through. And, and you know, it's so it's, it's kind of ridiculous. And um, when we first, like, chose to read this book, I thought... Oh, this is an exaggeration. Like, these things don't exist. Um, and I was telling Laura this uh, when we were uh, hanging out at uh, the bar the other day, and she was like, oh, no, that's not an exaggeration. Oh, yeah, they're, they're real things. You were made to be a fool, Paris. I was. <laughs> uh, and, yeah, so Laura has... You've lived on the 10,000 Islands or near... The no, Island? actually, I don't even think that's a real place, to be completely honest. Oh, I think um, it is. I have no idea. Uh, but... That, that. Paris, your your lack of Florida knowledge is showing. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I don't know shit about Florida. I've never been to Florida. Chris, have you? Uh, once. Oh, okay. I thought you hadn't been either, but um. No, I th- I think I went on like a Disney World trip or something mm. once. Which doesn't really count. Yeah. No, it doesn't. It's like the most sterile part of Florida. It's still <laughs> disgusting. <laughs> yeah. Um. And so yeah, Laura can talk to us about uh, alligator wrestling and alligator farms because I didn't think they were real. Oh, it's totally <laughs> do, real. Do, uh, why do people have alligator farms? Is the meat good or uh, something? So the whole thing about an alligator farm is uh, it's sort of a misleading um, name for an uh, for it's a tourist trap. It's a roadside attraction. So basically, what it is is these things live there anyways. Uh, and I don't know if you've ever like seen an alligator in person. They're basically can't, can't say I have uh, yeah, only either. on cartoons mostly. <laughs> yeah, or is, like in, in documentaries on like you know, Animal Planet or something. They're pretty much nature's perfect killing machines. <laughs> it's kind of like evolution started and then nature just went, nah, you're perfect. Just stay exactly how you are. You never have to change. <laughs> yeah, they're basically uh, dinosaurs. They're literally dinosaurs. They're the they're they're just tanks. They're big, toothy, impenetrable, yeah. hungry tanks. Uh so trying, if you have, you know, a piece of property that has, like, 500 alligators on it, yeah. what do you do? Do you try to get rid of the 500 alligators? No. You figure out how to <laughs> right. work around the 500 alligators. Right. So you so very carefully, I'd imagine. Them. Very carefully. Actually, probably less carefully than you should, um, which is why most of these people that work at these places are, like, you know, one-eyed Hank and lefty because they've you know lost the right yeah no no and you're totally right because the the book um calls upon that like i think um the father chief big tree uh in the book he he's missing parts of his fingers and so is the grandfather like they're all kind of fucked up um and i think what the the brother kiwi he's the only one who has no uh what a florida name huh kiwi kiwi jesus um 
Yeah, he has no uh, scars or scrapes or missing digits or anything, and it's, it's like... obviously the black sheep of the family. Yes, yes, exactly. That's exactly how he's painted. Um, so it's good to know that that, that point's actually real. I Like I said, yeah, I, I don't know, I'm a... You're fucking... glad to know that people get their... Well, I'm hands bitten <laughs> by, off by alligators. No, no, no. I mean, I'm glad. I'm glad that that was an accurate portrayal because I thought this was totally ridiculous, and turns out it's just reality uh, because reality is ridiculous. Well, that's kind of thematically relevant to how this book goes, isn't it, Paris? Yeah, it you, is. You thought it was magical and perhaps something special and unique, but in fact. No, it is not. Cold, yeah. hard reality. Yeah. That, well, that was something I liked about the book. But um, before we get too into the into the content, um, alligator wrestling. So, like, have you seen alligator wrestling? Have so, you wrestled an alligator? I have not re- tried to wrestle an alligator, no. I did try to abduct a baby alligator once. Um, <laughs> oh, uh, I think the hopefully the statute of limitations is up on that one. Or else the <laughs> yeah, <theater> yeah. cops <laughs> might come for you. Yeah, no, no. no it was my, my mother told me to turn around and take it back. <laughs> She's like, no, 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 take that back. I'm like, oh, But there, so there is apparently in existence an adorable picture of Laura holding this alligator that she tried to abscond with. Um, how old are you in the picture? I'm at like 10. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, like, maybe, maybe younger. I'm, I know I'm missing my front teeth and I'm wearing like all day the, glow. Because so the gator be. bit him off? Did you, did you have no front teeth because the gator took him? No. Oh, no, just a, just a little wee <laughs> little baby gator. He was, all, he was all full of chicken nuggets. He was just taking a nap. Oh, that's oh. cute. <laughs> Yeah. Is that what is that what alligators eat in the wild? Chicken yeah, they definitely, definitely. At least at these tourist shops. At least at the tourist yeah. shop, because there's always a McDonald's nearby. Oh god, that's <laughs> awful. Like, so is Florida just an endless stream of like McDonald's, alligator farm, tragedy, Disney yes. World <laughs> knockoff, and tragedy. millions of years of evolution to make the <laughs> yeah. perfect killing machine to chomp a to nugger. Eat just yeah, the right chicken way. nuggets exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's I don't know. So how did you only go? Did you like go to alligator farms a lot as a kid, or just like? Sometimes? No, we would just sort of. Um, so we lived in the northern part of Florida, which is lovingly referred to as L.A. or Lower Alabama. Um, <laughs> okay. But the rest of my family lived in Miami, which is also lovingly referred to as Northern Cuba. <laughs> but you have to drive through Disneyland basically to get there. Oh, um, and awesome. all along the further south you go, the more of these tourist traps that you see. Um, Gatorland being sort of the crown jewel, if you will, in this shit salad. Oh, Gator, Gatorland? Gatorland. Um, they have a massive albino alligator. That's fucking cool. Uh, which is one of the most terrifying things you've ever seen in your life. You're like, oh, oh that's a real life dragon. Right, yeah, yeah. Cool. Oh, I know I know now why people made those myths about it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, that's where it came from. Um, is it ice elemental by any chance? Yeah. I think it's that's an, what it's, the white ones are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not that far south. Yeah. But maybe why they're so, like, like mild mannered though. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe that's that's how they tamed the the ice dragons. Exactly. They, they, they just them. T- took them where it was really hot. Like you're gonna really hate this. Here you go. And now it's like uh, it's exactly. sad. <laughs> Naps. For Throw days. me a nugget. Give me more nuggets. <laughs> um, <laughs> but so we would just kind of. Um, I've always been sort of fascinated by these weird. You know, tourist traps like you know the house of the future, like all the you know like yeah. the, all the weird, goofy shit that you see when you're driving through the country with your parents or your friends. Yeah, because Laura, um, Laura has moved around a lot, um, so that's why she yeah has this uh, has this, this knowledge. <laughs> she has she has been in a lot of different places in the country. So, um, but yeah, so we would just as we were driving down to Miami to visit my you know other rest of our family, we would always stop at you know orange groves and. You know, trying to really get the feel for Mm. what the state's all about. Uh, And alligator farms were just kind of one of those things that you would, you know, stop and you'd get breakfast and you'd go look at the alligators and watch some guy named Bubba stick his arm in a tired old overfed alligator's mouth. Because <laughs> that's, that, that's, that that res- that's what that, the wrestling is. Yeah, I was going to ask, like, what is it? So in the book, they depict it as like... Um, I don't know. Ava Big Tree is the main character of the book, and she's the young girl. She's what is she? Twelve, Chris, or thirteen? Twelve or thirteen. Thirteen. I read the notes. Yes, yes. Yeah, <laughs> I read so the good. notes. You're so good. I'm giving her a little squeeze on the shoulder for being a good guest. Um, so yeah, she's thirteen, and she describes you know how she's practicing all these moves like. Oh, there's I, I forget what they're called, but it's almost sounds like she's talking. It's about, not really like, relevant to the story. Yeah, but it sounds like she's talking about you know like WWE wrestling, you know, like all these different moves. It's, or it's about as fake as that. <laughs> the yeah, Stone yeah, Cold yeah. Starter, right? The elbow <laughs> drop, right on that gator fucking. <laughs> well, yeah, and I'm wondering like, how could it possibly be? 
you know, be anything more than something staged because those animals are so fucking dangerous. I mean, to an extent, like, it can't possibly be, like, staged, staged, but, you know, when, when yeah, you Yeah, you can't really give the gator rehearsal notes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're really tough to work with. They're real divas like that. <laughs> they can't be. But they, like, mostly they just make sure that they're, they feed them, like, you know, two whole chickens before they do their show, oh, so see. they're, they're digesting so their bodies are they're moving slower they're Mm, you know plus they know like oh every day this asshole is going to come over here and touch me on the chin and i'm going to open my mouth and he's going to dangle his arm in there and everyone's going to go ooh ah and then i can go back to sleep like okay so it's just it's kind of routine for these things uh which is not to say that every once in a while somebody doesn't get squirrely and yeah try to take bubba's arm off because yeah why not yeah right (laughs) So yeah. was there a point, like, did, did you find these places more fascinating when you were a child and then, like, you maybe started growing up and they weren't so cool anymore to you? Uh, so that's that's an interesting question. As a kid, I didn't really think that they were that fascinating. I just thought it was kind of normal because, you know, when you're just around crazy all the time, it yeah. seemed, crazy seems normal. As an adult, uh, I got a lot more excited about it because it's like, holy mm. shit, this is not normal. Yeah, this is fucking weird. Like, yeah, which is why I didn't think it was real. Okay, so a bit of a reversal of things that because I, I, you know, I don't know if you picked up on this, but this is a podcast about books, uh, <laughs> not necessarily like <laughs> not alligators, and alligators. Not Florida's <laughs> geology or whatever. <laughs> I appreciate you being here to talk about this, though, because it, it, it does inform the setting of this thing, which is like Paris basically laid it out. It's, a, it's, it's basically the story of a family um, that owns this gator amusement park called Swamplandia, and the kids have been brought up in it their entire life. They're, they live on like an island that's uh, only reachable by ferry. Um, so they're pretty isolated. The kids are homeschooled, and they're not very exposed to the mainlander life as the it's put in the book. Yeah, and so, what, what time period does this take place? I, I was assuming '90s, but it was kind of difficult to tell. There were it doesn't no, there really. Were no cell I mean, phones, but the, yeah, there's not really yeah. much by way of cell phones. So pre cell phone is what I would say probably. Yeah, so my guess was '90s, maybe maybe '80s. I, I don't really know. It doesn't, re- you know, aside from the lack of there being cell phones, like, that's about, like, the only thing that yeah, is no, relevant. Yeah, no computers either are ever mentioned, so... Well, again, they live on an island, so, yeah. uh... It, well, the, uh, one ki- Kiwi goes off to the mainland to, like, work in a competing tourist attraction that's just... I guess it sounds to me like it was just a really dark hangar with some water attractions. Yeah, it's called, the, what, the World of Darkness, and it has, like... You know, I think Leviathan slide. It's a, yeah, it's I, I think that might be a cute like way around the fact that they couldn't afford much by way of lighting or something, so they just <laughs> called it a world of darkness. Yeah, and then they and then they kind of went with that theme, and there's like you know the the hell pool, and it's like yeah. blood. It's like anyway, the story starts basically with uh, the death of the matriarch of the family, Halola Big Tree. Um, succumbing to cancer essentially, and that kind of basically tearing the family apart because. Uh, she was the centerpiece attraction for a lot of the tourists that came by Swamplandia. So because her wrestling shows aren't a thing anymore, less and less people start coming by. So uh, Chief Big seems, Tree... It seems pretty rapid, too. Like, she dies and it's like everyone finds out and it's just, like, fucking over. Like, because they, they were talking about how they had to give refunds to all the people that showed up, like, right after she died. Because she wasn't there. Um, so yep. it, it did seem like a pretty quick descent. <laughs> I'm assuming there was a wind-up where she was in the hospital a bunch, too. Oh, that's true, yeah. You know? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah that's very true. Um, but yeah, and, and the whole family, like, their their last name is Big Tree, but really the dad just t- tells everyone to pretend they're Native Americans, and that name is just a fake, supposed-to-be Native American name, which is yeah, they're, all kinds they're of white fucked as, up. They're <laughs> white as heck, and they're just using uh, Native American imagery to pump up the, the tourist attraction theme park, essentially. Yeah, because they, I don't know, they seem to, they talk about how alligator wrestling is like a seminal activity, like a Native American activity, and I was like, I don't know. No, that's, that's dumb shit white people do. Yeah. Wrestle yeah, alligators. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. And, um, yeah, so, you know, the family, family's uh, already doing some dumb shit, but the kids are young and they're like, whatever, you know, Ava's 13, her sister Osceola is what, 16? Yeah, and, just about, and, and Kiwi's, Kiwi's like one year, one year older. 17, so. yeah, turning, about to turn 18. Um, and yeah, so like, as everything starts to fall to shit, like, you know, the kids are trying to find their way without their mom, and, like, Kiwi is kind of intent on 
getting out of there and making some money and going to school um, just because he... He wants to help his family still. He doesn't want to just completely... He wants to go to the mainland, go to, like, proper public school, get a good job, and, like, send money back to the family, which is why he takes the World of Darkness job. Right. And um, Osceola becomes consumed with um, this spirit book she finds in the library boat, which is an amazing invention in in the story that I really liked. Cute little um, scenery where, where yeah. they, there's like because since they live on an island, there's a bunch of like old boats and dredges and like other because other people live on other islands that they own. So like there was this guy that just used to collect books and throw them on his boat that he just stuffed full of books and then he died and then that boat just hung around there and people would take and leave books as they saw fit. Yeah, which I think is a cool idea. Um, Sounds about right. Yeah, and so the kids, you know, because they're fucking homeschooled, like they don't know anything, so they like exactly. to go to the library boat and you know read stuff and pick through it and Osceola finds this uh, what is it called the spirits telegraph or the spiritists spiritists telegraph basically just a kind of mysticism based book with spells and stuff to cast and she basically uh, you know with the death of her mother and her dad basically disconnecting uh, both emotionally and then literally like physically pretty quickly because the the dad leaves his kids just on this island by themselves after yeah, a period. Like, He's just so, like, so like yeah, see the, you later. Yeah, the, so the, yeah, it's like Kiwi leaves just randomly. He just decides, like, I'm out. Doesn't tell anybody. I think he leaves him a note or something. Just yeah. takes off. And then, like, what, a few days or a few weeks later, the dad, Chief Big Tree, is like, oh, I'm gonna go to the mainland to see Grandpa. And, uh, and then, like, okay, my theory, he was actually going to fucking abandon them. I don't think he had any intention of coming back if it weren't for Kiwi finding him at the casino later. Like, I wholeheartedly believe, wholeheartedly believe that, that the mainland was the pack of cigarettes and that dad was fucking <laughs> gone. Like, like that guy was not coming back. I mean, where were they yeah, going to go? They're on an island surrounded by alligators. They're totally safe, right? Yeah, right? They'll like, be fine. I think he's a piece of shit. I hate that guy. I think he was probably still getting the, the ferry guy to, like, leave them food and stuff. Yeah, he was, like, but I don't think he was going to come back. I, yeah, I, I don't really... It, it's not really elucidated upon, but he straight up just abandons Ava and Osceola on the island to fend for themselves, and they, like... So they're funny. very young, so they can kind of barely hack it. Yeah, like, they're eating, like, weird stuff in combination because they're 13 and 16, like... And, of course, Osceola descends deeper and deeper into the Spiritist Telegraph book, and she basically starts uh, dating ghosts, essentially, which is, yep. uh, I guess, the hip new yeah, trend for... Yeah, that was interesting for... in the Wikipedia yeah, cliff yeah. notes. I was like, this just took a weird yeah, left turn. <laughs> right, and so and so the... Um, There's going to be a lot of weird turns. Yeah. Oh, I'm excited. I love it. I'm so excited. Yeah, I think... So, How are you? And... I am. Can you tell? <laughs> Waiting anxiously. Bated breath. Yeah, so y- um, you feel like there's a bunch of magic in this book, perhaps. Yeah, like right? there's like, like some mysticism and like some, you know, fun otherworldly stuff to, to read about. Well, yeah, because Ossie's sort of possession starts seeming more and more real because she starts like going out all night and like looking really haggard and sleeping during the day and then like not coming back for days at a time. And, you know, Ava's just like, oh, at first she doesn't, you know, doesn't think any of it's real. And, Kiwi thinks she's just masturbating at night or something. Like I think. Yeah, that's what I thought that. too. It wasn't I, I just also, Kiwi. Yeah, I also thought that maybe she was just thinking herself off or whatever, you know. <laughs> oh yeah, right. <laughs> um, and so I was like, ah, oh, whatever. She's not really possessed. But then the book does a really good job of of almost convincing you that something is going on. You know, something otherworldly. And so Osceola disappears into the into the woods and tells Ava, like, I'm getting married. To my ghost boyfriend. I mean, she cycles through several ghost so boyfriends. you didn't do that when you were 16? Because that's totally my 16-year-old story. Just wait, saying. wait, did you marry a ghost at 16? Oh, no, we didn't did get you? married. Oh, you wanted to. <laughs> no, it, was, it was just a friends with, it was a ghost with benefits. Ghost with benefits, exactly. <laughs> no, but I mean, you know, Laura and I are both, you know, current metalheads, former 16-year-old girls who would turn into metalheads, so I think we both probably liked ghost shit at that age. Um, no, I mean at sixteen, I was—I think I was a little too skeptical even at that time to have had a ghost boyfriend. But I can understand somebody who's like lived on an island their whole life and has no. You don't really have any other options. Yeah, right. Like, oh, who are you okay. gonna take your brother? Like, yeah, well, it's Florida. I just I like, <laughs> but what if your ghost boyfriend's name is Louis Thanksgiving? <laughs> that was his name. 
oh man, was this book written about me? Seriously. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, Laura's like, damn it, Louis, I knew you'd try again with another human David piece Christmas. Of shit. Yeah. He, he worked on a dredge that yep. was digging a canal through Florida, and then he uh, died on that boat. I forget how, though. Um, yeah, Osceola. And, and so the whole thing with Osceola and, like, the spirit book is she feels like she can really, she can communicate with ghosts. Like, she gets possessed by them and therefore absorbs their memories. Crossing right. over with Osceola Big Crossing Tree. over with Osceola. Is, yeah, what the, is, is what the theme park should have transitioned into. Yeah, seriously. Like, God, this, yeah, this this book strangely segues nicely from our last book, Crossing mm-hmm. Over with John Edward. Um, so, you know, Ossie tells Ava the story, and it's actually very, I feel like it's very convincing. Um, the story that she gives about how Louis died, it's like, I don't know, something on the boat explodes or malfunctions and, like, all the, all the dredgemen die on the boat. And and all of this is because she just found his shirt on the dredge when she and Ava were exploring and it had, had LT embroidered on the chest pocket. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that there's still a remaining question in this book as to whether or not Aussie was, like, crazy or could talk to ghosts. I mean, I feel like at the end, they're like, oh, no, she was just schizophrenic. But I'm like... I don't know. It's the... Uh, I don't know. Could go either Perhaps way. you were looking for one last little bit of magic. Yeah. yeah, this book This book definitely does a good job of being like, oh man, the world is so cool and magical. Just kidding. Real life is evil. Um, and yeah, so basically what ends up happening, just to speed this uh, t- topic along a little bit, yeah. uh, Osceola, ro- Osceola rather, runs off t- with her ghost boyfriend. Yeah. She takes the barge, it seems, and leaves Ava by herself. I don't know what she thought her little sister was going to do. Dude, I don't the- know. In the meantime, but she decides to run off and get married to old Louie. So Ava's by herself and freaking out because she's convinced Osceola is dead or just abandoned somewhere. Yeah, because um, Aussie tells her, like, oh, like, we're going to take the dredge and go, I have to go to the underworld with him to get married. And she tells her, like, the underworld has a, a physical entrance at a real location, uh, you know, within the swamp. It's, uh, do you remember what it was called? It was, like, these two big rocks and there's, like, a strait between them. They just remember. kept referring to it as the un- entrance to the underworld yeah, the after underworld, a while. Yeah. So yeah, I, that's, that's and, what it is in my brain. And so after Aussie's been gone for, I mean, she's not even gone that long. She's gone a few hours and Ava's like, oh, my God. The dredge is gone, like, she's gone, I have to go find her. And right as she's making, sort of making this decision while she's out in the swamp near their house, you know, where the dredge was, she looks up, and there's a man standing in the tree. And they proceed to have this conversation, and, and I mean, at this point in the book, I, I definitely was like, oh man, this dude's gonna like, this dude's bad news. The bird man. Uh, Chris, I don't know. How did you feel when Ava met the Birdman? I was immediately, uh, you know, kind of skittish because it's literally just a random dude. Standing uh, apparently, in a tree? The Birdman is like, a, a, there's these people that make a living by scaring birds away from island farms. Apparently? I don't know. So, I that's like what he does for his job. He, he's like kind of covered in feathers or something that he made into a jacket. And he just goes around nomadically scaring away birds from farms for pay to make sure the birds don't fuck with the farms. I think that's what his deal is. Yeah, he's a scarecrow. I mean, yeah, he's a living but, scarecrow. But, but like a, one that walks around and is a creep. Yeah. And, and um, you know, she, the way she was talking to him at first was that he was... Uh, really skilled at making bird calls and he had this fancy bird whistle and you know she she talks to him and i guess he climbs down from the tree and then she i don't know ava makes this decision to like grab his hand and take him back to her house with her and at that point i was like kid what are you doing you can't be taking a weird bird man from the fucking swamp back to your house like what are you doing Oh, She's God. worried about her sister, and she wants someone to help her find the entrance to the underworld, which she believes the Birdman can do. Yeah, because the Birdman straight up says, he straight up says, like, yeah, I know where that is, and I can help you. And so, like, when that happened, I was like, oh, okay, maybe he's not actually evil. Like, maybe he's just, he's just, this, this is really, like, kind of a sort of pseudo-realist magical thing going on. Um... Yeah, it's like, again, the book is kind of setting up like, oh, he's a weird bird, man. They're going to the underworld. So, you know, you might think, even though Ava's position wavers between skeptical and, like, believing in that stuff, mostly because she just wants to see her sister, I think. And because she's 13. I mean, you know. You know, she, it, it really does kind of set up this air of, like, hey, it might be real that these magical things are possible. 
Yeah, and then, you know, they go on this adventure to find the Underworld, and as things progress, you kind of slowly begin to realize that, you know, basically the magical realism starts to unravel pretty quickly as they go on this adventure. Um, I mean, I'll just quickly say that, like, in between the chapters about Ava and Aussie, there are individualized chapters about Kiwi, and, like, I personally didn't really give a shit about Kiwi, and I feel like his whole story could have been cut from the book and it would have been way better. Um, but there's, like, Kiwi's coming-of-age story is happening while he's off the island, and, and you get chapters of that, and then, in be- and then you know, in between... He's, the he's working at the there. World of Darkness, and he's, yeah. like, kind of getting in with this crew of, you know, uh, theme park worker stoners that are just your average, you know, theme park Parties. worker stoner type. Yeah, yeah. Which are basically written very well. I will say, I, that's the thing we haven't really quite said yet, is that this book is... Well written. This oh, isn't yeah. that this, terrible of a book at yeah, all. It's kind of weird. Kind of. Like, I so it's excellently written. I mean, I I can't really say enough about how wonderfully surprised I was. Um, although the uh, Chris, you want to talk about the Twitter account Similendia, which uh, points out <laughs> the fact that this book has like hundreds of similes in it, but uh, the writing is is really great. Uh, despite the, that. Yeah, like, pretty much every third or fourth sentence has a like this or as if that comparison to mm-hmm. something. Yeah. Uh, we'll, you know, while we're on this topic, I actually have that Twitter up in front of me. So <laughs> let me read off a couple of some of the lines here. Some of them are really good quality, good, I would say. Yeah, like, I think, she's, I think she's excellent. She does a really good job. So Karen Russell does a great job of of writing really beautifully and also writing about gross things really accurately. Um, so she's just got, yeah, it's, the writing's great. Chris, go, go ahead with some Here's similes. some examples. He could see one small bird rowing its wings into the sun over the interstate, centered up there like the face on a coin. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, now I'm trying to find some good ones here. Or some ridiculous ones. Here's a ridiculous one. A pigeon waddled along a pipe, lifting its mauve wings like an acrobat. Not so good. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just think her, her writing was really great. Um, and she, yeah, I mean, and, uh, so, so yeah, this book is like... Hold on, I'm, I'm still, like, just scrolling through for some really good ones here. <laughs> Here's a really nice one, actually. Then our footsteps ran out, and fear unspooled through me as slowly as a yawn. Yeah, that's really good. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, it's weird, like, the, um... Yeah, I feel like this book isn't terrible, but it does have some problems. Like I said, it's sentence like, to sentence, paragraph to paragraph, it's very well written on that sort of like micro yeah. level where every you know there's this craftiness to the phrasing, like that one I, I I just told you, and and the dialogue is really well written. Like I said, those carnies are super believable. They talk way more vulgar than the other kids, and like there's definitely a sort of insulated, isolated vibe to how uh, the big tree kids speak, whereas everyone else on the mainland is, you know, just talks like a normal person, I would say. Yeah, and I feel, yeah, I feel like the dialogue was really convincing. I mean, in fact, you know, there's some characters in the book at the World of Darkness where I was like, I've worked in, you know, I've, we've all worked in retail at some point in our lives, and I was like, I've absolutely worked with people like that. Like, there was some, there was like a Trinidadian guy who was like cheating on his wife with every other girl at the park, and I was like, Yep, I've also worked with someone like that. And, like, you know, the guy that's, like, a super stoner and just wants to get laid all the time. I mean, I just feel like they were really accurate portrayals of what real people uh, are and how they behave. So that was really cool, because I feel like so many of the books we read for Terrible Book Club have this, like, horrible stilted dialogue, and the characters say things that no human being would fucking (laughs) say, you know? But this this book really, really was great um, in that way. And I think think we just have some issues with the story. like, here's know. a couple. Here's a couple more good uh, Similendia tweets oh. from this uh, Twitter account. <laughs> Theodore Glide was still throwing his arms around as if he could argue the death back into the hole of the moon. That's really good. Um, the buzzards were perched along the trusses and gunwales on the cabin roof so that the whole structure looked upholstered in black velvet. Yeah, like I just I think that her her. Meth- her like the way she describes stuff is really great, and it was it was very immersive. Um, and I I actually wanted to keep reading this book. I read this book in like two days. It was uh, yeah, it was pretty good. 
Here's well, another one. Here's oh, another one. Chris. What rolled through Louis's mind were like the shells of thoughts, a series of O's, round and empty, like the discarded rhymes of screams. So good. Like, that's it's pretty one. good. It, yeah. It's like actually pretty good and like thoughtful and descriptive. Oh, yeah, I was so surprised by that. When we were, when so on the micro level, stuff really works that way. Oh, yeah. But... And, no, and no problems with like grammar or syntax or editing. Like it was all well, edited very professionally. No problems. But... but so we're back. Back in here with the bird man. Yeah. So, you know, you can... You, obviously, as their adventure continues, you know something is fucking up. And, of course, eventually the inevitable happens. Basically, you know, there's a couple of encounters that uh, Ava and the Birdman have. Especially, like, one of them is, like, with a, a, a ranger. Like, a par- almost like a park ranger. Uh, yeah, that yeah, he's a national patrols. park ranger, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, he's, and he sees Ava and the Birdman traveling. And he's like, hey, Ava, what's going on? You know this guy? So the Birdman tells her to pretend to be his cousin. And that they're, you know, just traveling along together to... They're going on a fishing trip. Exactly. Yeah. And so he convinces Ava to do that. Yeah, exactly. And then then shortly after that, they pass by a group of gator hunters. But the Bieber brand is like, no, Ava, that's the spirits of the underworld. You'll get us killed if they find us. Yeah, I mean, and if you're an adult reading this, I mean, it just smacks of, you know, grooming and manipulation. Yeah. But, well, yeah. yeah, so guess what happens? Yeah, yeah. and I mean, <laughs> so this is kind of my main issue with the story is that inevitably the Birdman rapes Ava. And... Um, my, so the, I can't, I can't believe I'm saying this, but like, I feel like the rape scene and the kind of like, um, the consequences, all of that is written really well. And I know it sounds kind of insane to say that a rape scene is written well, but it so effectively gets across it's the way that a violation like that feels. It made me feel super gross. It, it and but it like it, the thing it does is it does not ruminate on the physicality of it a whole lot. Most of that scene is taking place inside of Ava's head and her just trying to deal with what's happening, what it feels like, and how it's basically messing with her thoughts. Yeah, and and she kind of goes back it's and forth. It's extremely uncomfortable. Yeah, and I mean, I I I can't say that I've ever read a scene like that that was more believable. Um. And, it, I mean, when that happened, though, like, because I was, like, leading up to it, I was like, oh, my God, I really hope this book doesn't go there. Oh, no, oh, no. And then it happened, and I was like, fuck, fuck, God damn it. This is, uh. But, you know, part... So, I'm really torn on the whole... Um, the whole kind of trope in novels of the female lead um, having to be raped to kind of have the story continue, or, like, using rape as a thing that, um, yeah, like, moves... moves as a plot a point. Yeah, as a plot point. And it's... It's usually you know, what a female character has to deal with is like yeah. a sexual assault of some kind. Like well, that's, that's obviously our only motivation, right? right. <laughs> well, and the, and the thing meanwhile, is so another point I want to make. Sorry to interrupt Paris for a sec, but I want to make the point that meanwhile, during Kiwi's story, he saves a girl from drowning, and she, you know, takes a liking to him for a brief period, and he loses his virginity to her. So he's almost like rewarded with sex for like mm-hmm. happening to do a good job and be a nice guy. Yeah, and I kind of wonder if that's what the point, like part of the point that. Karen Russell was trying to make with Kiwi Story because yeah, otherwise Kiwi so. Story seems largely pointless. Basically, mm-hmm. at the he's training to be a pilot. At the end, he ends up on his first flight. He finds Osceola and the bar, the dredge, just like somewhere. And we, we'll talk later about like how him being a pilot is totally insane and how I anyway. Um, but oops, sorry, whack the mic. But um, the whole sorry, I just want to get back to the the point about like rape uh, with female characters. For me, I'm torn because it's like. I hate that that's a stereotype that, like, you know, like Laura was saying, it's like, yep, that's the only thing that ever motivates us, being sexually assaulted. That's the only way we develop as people. But then again, it's like, isn't it kind of fucking true, though, that so many people are sexually assaulted? Like, yeah. so many of us are victims of sexual assault that it's like, is it a trope or is it just reality? Well, it's <laughs> also interesting to compare that the male's storyline is also totally dictated by his sexual encounter. Yeah, that's So true. why is his reward being positive and her yep. trying to do the right thing being negative. Right. Like, yeah, no, and I think I think, you know, I think Chris is right that I think Karen Russell was trying to do something there. I feel like a lot of people that read this book fucking missed it. All So many of the reviews I read of this book 
just missed the whole point of this. The book. whole crux really, of the book, really to me, is is the fact that after that scene with the Birdman, it, there's not any magical mysticism to the book for the remainder of it at all. It's just right. dealing with heavy consequences and shit. Kills and that's, the magic. Yep. That, that's the whole point of the book, is this horrible traumatic event that changed Ava from being a child into a traumatized adult. And that's, dude, that's what happens to so many of us. I mean, and I know, you know, I know men get sexually assaulted too, and it's underreported, and therefore people think that it doesn't happen, but, uh, you know, women are predominantly the victims of sexual assault, and I mean, that's just what happens, man. Like, something like that happens to you, and your fucking world changes, and I think that Karen Russell is, I mean, she's just the most articulate author when it comes to describing something like that. I've never read another book where, um, where such a terrible thing was handled so well, uh, I mean, even some of the grosser details I felt like were perfect. And it was like, this is, like you said, this is so terrible, it makes me want to die inside, but then I'm like, oh, but it's That's so how it accurate. Feels. <laughs> yeah, but it's like, but this is so accurate, like, I have to love it because of the accuracy. Um, and so I, uh, uh, my, my lady friend, actually, uh, she read this book. We, oh, I, yeah, I, I Rebecca, right? Yeah. yeah, I selected this from the random uh, book pile that I took out of my music video filming thing, and it looked kind of looked kind of dopey from the cover in the back, so I was like, let's give it a try. Yeah, we so it probably it wasn't a good, film. like, terrible selection, per se, but the interesting part about, like I said, uh, she didn't like the book at all. She was like, oh, that's a good book for your podcast because of this thing that happens in it that changed my opinion on it. And to her, she felt like that scene was sort of a betrayal of all the setup of the magical realism aspect of the book that then just gets wiped away pretty abruptly because this happens towards the like the last 80 pages of the book or so. Yeah, but dude, that's why I loved it. That's fucking real life, man. Like, yeah, I so loved it I because it, it's so it's so, it's so markedly different from other books where it would be all magical realism or it would be all, you know, very serious and dry. I think, I think it's that way, as you said, to demonstrate, like, the loss of childhood and innocence when something so traumatic happens to you. And I think she does it beautifully, and I think a lot of people fucking miss that point. And I would hate to say that about Rebecca because I think your girlfriend's actually really smart and I, I think maybe I think maybe she was just made very uncomfortable by it and I totally get that as well um yeah she that she I think she was just made really uncomfortable by yeah. it also like when she picked like a lot of people that probably when they picked up this book they thought it was some kind of like yeah. magical realism yeah. based thing and they felt kind of yep. like cheated right. where's, yeah, my, where's right. my ending yeah and I think <laughs> yeah. I think yeah I think um she, oh, I, I mean think, Rebecca's also the type of person that like if a TV show is full of asshole characters she doesn't like the TV show because they're all <laughs> assholes yeah even I mean, if it's like a really funny show or something. yeah I I think that um I think Rebecca has a you know Rebecca has a good point like Laura said you know you feel cheated I I do think that this book should have done a better job of marketing and maybe uh like in the synopsis on the back at least kind of preparing you yeah. for the fact that you're not getting your ice dragon gonna, yeah, right, yeah. albino gator that comes and yeah. eats the bird man yeah, <laughs> doesn't you're not, happen. <laughs> that would be great. Oh my god. Imagine, yeah. Like, editing yeah. notes. And, yeah, right. Alternate ending. <laughs> yeah, like, like the, the ice dragon albino alligator is not going to come from the underworld and eat the bird man. Like, it, I just really think they should have prepared the audience more and I think they would have had less negative reviews and people would have a better opinion of it. Although, this book does it is generally considered really excellent and Karen Russell this was her first novel after having only written short stories um it's what, a really fantastic debut Ava for Fingering. for a novel like i have oh, to, if yeah. i fabulous i would say so um, I see, by the way uh can we take this moment to say that we can in fact like books we're not here to just yeah and, and we're not we're not here and oh yeah we'll have to talk about our first no we're going to talk now. about that this thing uh, right now paris this this other thing that happens oh. um <laughs> Okay. I'll keep some details vague here for, uh, I don't know, <laughs> just for, uh, being the nice guy's sake, let's say. Uh, we recently received an email from an author of one of the books that we read, and it was basically one line of, hey, I found your guy's thing because I have a Google alert set up. Um, I find you what you do gratuitously cruel, and I don't understand why you do it week after week. And here are uh, a bunch of publications that you shouldn't read because they all really liked my book. And the rest of the email was one giant unformatted series of positive review quotes about the his books and his yeah, works. Yeah, so I was the one who found this at work. I was um, I was just taking a minute to check my personal email and terrible book email and like my band stuff. Because, you know, sometimes when you're at work, you just, you know, after you're working on something, you just got to take, like, five minutes. So I was like, oh, I'll check this. And I was just like, 
are you fucking serious? Like, and the, and the author who sent us this email, I was, I was really surprised because he's like an established serious author who's like successful. And so I'm Clearly like, Clearly if he had all those you... positive reviews. Yeah, and I'm just like, why would you, why would you even bother saying anything to us? Like. Well, it wasn't for you, it was for him. Yeah, that's very, I, I gotta very remind, a good point. I gotta remind myself that I have all these really good reviews God. Here. Yeah, here you go. I'm going to reread this email so I can revalidate <laughs> it, the fact off to it. It, it very much smacked of insecurity when someone... You know, not to, I can understand. I, I make art stuff, too, and it sucks when someone talks shit about your stuff, which yeah, has so happened to me before. But me, too. And, and also now, it seems weird that we're doing a book that we really like, like immediately after receiving this email, as if we're being <laughs> like, no, just, we're not mean. We're no, not jerks. Just, Come it on. Was, it was honestly just a coincidence. We were already, Swamplandia was already in the works when we got this email. And um, Swamplandia, like Chris said, we just picked it randomly out of a pile. We didn't know what to expect. So, um, yeah, I mean, and, and this author, like, I just want, I, I just wish he would have understood that, like, first of all, we didn't engage in any ad hominem attacks, as a friend of mine pointed out. Like, we didn't. We didn't sit here and talk shit about him. Like, we talked about his book and what we thought about about it when we read it. And that's just what you do when you're reviewing media of any kind. I mean, and like Chris said, you know, Chris and I are both in bands and we know what it's like when people don't like something you lovingly created. Like, and, and, I don't know. I guess I'm just really surprised that he... First of all, I don't even think he listened to the episode. Um, I think that he probably just saw maybe the description of the episode, which is really silly, and was like, oh, I want fucking assholes. I mean... Maybe. I wanted to write you an ass your review. Yeah, <laughs> maybe maybe he did listen he, to it. That was but, technically um, a, a nasty review. He yeah. called us very cruel. He, he was like, "You guys are mean, yeah. like uh, gratuitously uh, cruel." And I, I, I would just love to know why it's gratuitously cruel to review something and point out things that it needs to improve. Like, that's I think just, the fact that we cruel. he <laughs> thinks the fact that we're purposefully kind of looking for really awful stuff to talk about is the cruel part. Hey, I think that he just doesn't have a sense of humor. Or you guys his, are mean. Or no, that's his, what it is. Yeah. You guys are mean. Yeah, we're just assholes. But, <laughs> no, I mean, I think, you know, we're... Uh, he, look, man, we're doing a comedy show. Like, I'm sorry, but comedy is only funny when it's irreverent and pushes boundaries and, you know, does things that are quirky. Like, I, I just don't think this... I think this guy is just very serious and he doesn't really... He doesn't seem like the kind of dude that's into humor. Um, or at least not into our style of humor. <laughs> he just um, has never laughed once in his No, life. he doesn't look like he has, man. Like, I, I don't know. I mean, we're, we're keeping it on the down low. I mean, some people know about it because I, I definitely mentioned it to some people. But, um, <laughs> you know, look, man. Hey, man, first hate no mail is a, is a really nice feeling, I think. Yeah, I mean, as as uh, my friend Jackie said, we must be doing something right. I guess. Congratulations, you made it. Someone hates you. <laughs> Woohoo! Made it! But, I mean, um, dude has a Google alert set up for himself. I'm not going to act like I've never Googled my own, like, yeah, band's name to see if we popped yeah. up anywhere. But, that. like, just to have the alert set up, I think, is a little For your much. own name is, yeah, that's kind of fucking ridiculous. Like, yeah, I, I just think, I don't know. The guy seems perfectly successful, and I mean, I'm. I feel like it's very possible that if we read one of his other books, we would like it. Um, just not that one. Yeah, just not that one. That one just wasn't our style, um, and it honestly did have some problems that he should probably think about. Um, but I don't think he ever will. Um, so, yeah, that's thanks that. For email. Um, <laughs> hey, you know, thanks you. Please reply back if you happen to listen to this one, sir. I'm sure he. Well, actually, no. I'll just put his name in the description. Yeah, just put his name in the description again because he's a oh, crazy yeah, he person. Will. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that, you know, he, he's just wasting our time. I mean, somebody reviews your book and doesn't like it. Like, whatever, man. Like, we it was, it was the really what, like, made it awful for me was the fact that, like, it was just the 90% of the email was review quotes from other publications and that he Dude. insinuated that we shouldn't read those publications as if us disagreeing on one review from that publication means we can't agree with anything else in it. Yeah. Also, the fact that all the quotes were completely unformatted, copied and pasted oh right God. after each other in one I, huge He probably paragraph. has them saved in, like, a notepad on his laptop. Yeah, he probably or, like, does. On his phone, just so, like, anytime he runs across it, he has to be like, yeah. like, oh, yeah. For, he, he, he just posts it up, like, in a forum somewhere, so he gets a Google alert about it and oh feels God. good about himself. Oh, God. Yeah, and I, I, um, I really wish that I could... Um, like post the screenshot I took of the email because it's so large it filled up my entire like Gmail screen on a computer. So like think about how large that is. It's like <laughs> ridiculous. Man has a lot of good reviews. I, yeah, and I People mean like he's it. he's won awards for his other books. So like, dude, you're fine. Don't worry about a couple of idiots who 
didn't like one of the one of the stories you wrote and and you know talked about it in a funny way. I mean, yeah, he's laughing I, all the way to the bank. So who cares? Exactly. Yeah. So I was. That's why I was really surprised. I mean. I don't know, and I didn't want to, like, I didn't want to respond or, like, engage with him on Twitter or anything, because I don't, like, neither of us want to fucking get into shit with people unless they're total idiots. I mean, I think this guy just, I don't know. Maybe I think Laura insecure. was right that it was a self-validating email yeah. meant more for him than Correct. for us. Yeah, I think, I think she's right. But, um, All right, so yeah. that that I just want to put a little interesting cap on that of that neat little thing that happened. So back to uh, Swamplandia, which is a good book. Mm-hmm. I think it might be our first, like, four-star review. Yeah, it's definitely. I mean, it it has some weird plot holes in the fact not not plot holes, not but plot like holes. Mm-hmm. Uh, the fact that uh, Ki, you know Kiwi happens to find Aussie on his first flight ever. Well, okay, okay, and the fact that like this kid is even learning how to fly a plane. So when Kiwi starts working at the World of Darkness, he's like a janitor, and then he like moves up to lifeguard after a few months, and then after he saves that girl, everyone's like enamored with him. And then they're talking about him learning how to fly, and I thought this was, like, a flight simulation thing in the park, because why would any business train and pay for a 17-year-old to be trained to fly a real plane? Like, I was so... Like, I thought it was a flight simulation thing, or, like, a, a like, I don't know, like, a tiny miniature plane like it, like in I mean, a that's, ride that's like, a that's a thing too though that yeah they do it is that, that they, does they have, happen they have planes that you that are air and they, they yeah, land yeah. on the water yes so that's totally a thing i, I didn't like i said read the book i just read the cliff notes on wikipedia yeah. but i don't know what the world of darkness you said it was a water park right yeah so and that's it's got water thing. themed it has water themed rides in a big empty dark hangar yeah. Okay, so yeah, so maybe they just had a plane hanging out in the hangar. Well, and they were they, just, well, they, <laughs> they were, were gonna, gonna do yeah, they with were this. like trying to come up with uh, it was gonna be like a new thing people could see it was like pla- planes. I don't know, but I just I just thought it really was really astounding that a company would train a seventeen year old to be a pilot. Uh, the whole time I thought it was just part of the like sort of the like childlike magical shit that was going on where Kiwi was like thinking he was going to really fly a plane, but it was really just going to be, like, a ride or something. But then he was actually fucking flying a plane, and my mind was blown, and I was like, oh my god, I can't believe they let him fly this plane, this is horrifying. I think it's a little indicative of sort of the ramshackle nature of the World of Darkness, because, like, you know, the kids learning to fly, you know, teenagers learning to fly at that age is definitely a common thing. Yeah, my, um, my cousin's a pilot, and he was learning how to fly when he was, like, 12 or something, but... Yeah, but, really but the fact that, like, a, a, a corporate entity would, yeah. like, take Sponsor. one of their, like, junior lifeguards and be like, you know what? Let's train you to fly this thing purely because sense. you got yeah. us good press as a person who saved a drowning person in our park. Yeah, and, well, and also because throughout the book, you, you start after a few Kiwi chapters, you start to realize that he thinks he's really smart and has this big vocabulary, but he pronounces words wrong constantly. And because he read like them in idiot. a book and he's never heard them out loud. That's yeah. that's why yeah. people pronounce words wrong is because they're well read, but they haven't heard the word exactly. out loud. And so I thought it was just another one of those things where he was kind of like, I don't know, like, you know, making it out to be more than it was. And then actually one of the parts I hated in this book was when he actually flies a plane and finds Osceola with the dredge, like, miles from where she was before. And I'm just like, oh, man, that's such a shitty way to end this otherwise good book. Like, really? You're just gonna reunite the characters with this chance meeting while this kid is flying a plane? Like, and he just happens to see his sister down below? I don't know. I just, I thought it was a really fucking lazy way to end the book. Um, it's the last bit of magic. Yeah, it's that last, yeah. <laughs> the teeny last tiny bit of magic. Little... But, like, like, Kiwi's yeah. world is also shattered by, you know, the, the magical thing is shattered when he finds his dad just working as an a, a MC in, like, the strip club side of a casino or something. Yeah, I mean, and and he's just like, oh, man, and he, tried, he tries to, like, kind of tell himself, like, oh, it's fine, you're just gonna come back, because, like, he did this while we were kids. He and Mom, you know, he used to go to the mainland for a couple months at a time, like, I guess the kids never realized that he must have been doing something like this their whole lives just to make ends meet, because the alligator park wasn't the most profitable thing in the world, obviously. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess the whole Kiwi thing, I, well, like, we were all talking about this earlier, but it's like Kiwi is having this, his male coming-of-age story, and he continually gets rewarded, like you said, you know. Like with most male coming-of-age stories? Exactly. And and where and then his sister gets 
totally, like, ruined in her, like, she's coming of age even younger than him and gets raped and abused by this weird fucking homeless bird guy. Um, and abandoned and by literally everybody. Abandoned by her dad and her siblings. I mean, and and then Kiwi continues to allow, is a, continued to, blah, he's allowed to continue to be the hero of the story when he's the one that finds Aussie and then instigates the search that then finds Ava. And it's like, this is fucking bullshit. Like, god damn it. Why? Why? That's probably like the one like bad part of this book, I would say. And I, again, I don't know if Karen Russell was actually trying to make a point about how like male coming of age stories are portrayed versus female stuff, but is, are you like pointing it out or are you just doing it at a certain point, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, I hope that's what she was trying to do. Um, but I guess we will Perhaps know. we'll receive an email from her and the many reviews that said otherwise or something. I don't know. I, I hope not. That would be <laughs> terrible. Um, Karen Russell seems cool. I hope she wouldn't do that. Um, she won a she won a genius award for her uh, her writing. Oh, actually. they give those out, do they? <laughs> I think it was like a MacArthur grant or make something. I don't know. <laughs> the genius <laughs> award. <laughs> the McDonald's she got the genius. Mc, it was the McNugget. <laughs> the McNugget. <Yeah. laughs> McNugget. Circling back around to those alligators. <laughs> the McNugget's yeah. McNugget's genius award. Um, <laughs> no, she really did win. Um, I think it was the MacArthur Foundation or something. I like that you called it a genius award, Paris. <laughs> no, that is what it's called. I'm not saying that. That's what the, it's like the a genius award bar. is called. Yeah. Neither full of geniuses nor alcohol. No, yeah, no. no. Nope. She, it was actually called the, the genius award. Like, I'm not just saying that. That's I know. We know. We're teasing. Oh, okay, okay. It's just such a dopey name. Like, yeah, oh, I guess you guys get to pick all the geniuses out there. Uh, well, I think and, a genius, like, genius writing award would have a better name. Yeah. Well, I think there was more to the name, but that's like... That's genius is in the name, and that's like what people call it. Um, but she, yeah, she was given it because she was so. I think she was thirty when this novel came out. Um, Something around there. She looks yeah. super young on the back cover of, of on like the about me thing. I, she yeah. looks like she's like seventeen to me. She looks yeah. She looks like she's like twenty instead of thirty. So uh, I guess uh, yeah. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I just I just wish the book didn't feel like it ended in such a lazy way. But like you said, if she was using. You know, if the juxtaposition of Kiwi's kind of triumphant coming of age and Ava's kind of like really tragic coming of age story was, you know, pointed and done in a meaningful way, then I'm fine with it. I just really wish that they could have been found a more conventional way and it didn't involve the fucking brother becoming a pilot. Like, I just feel like they could have, like, one of the park rangers could have found Ava or Aussie at any point in time. Or, like, yeah. those those gator fisher farmer uh, hunters. Gator, God. Gator fisher farmer hunters. I don't know what I'm saying anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the gator hunters that they encountered when the Birdman was like, oh, no, they're underworld ghosts. Don't talk to them. Uh, they ended up, like, I think they said something, actually, to somebody, right? And that was, like, part of the the way that they ended up. Yeah, they Ava. definitely said, like, oh, well, we saw that weird girl I think or someone thought they saw a girl and then yeah. they connected the dots when the missing persons report came out for Ava or something mm -hmm. but do they all, so do they again I didn't read the book so at the end after he finds the two sisters do they all end up getting back together is this sort of like yeah, so dad yeah. aunt, dad took off and abandoned them then the brother comes back and you know leaves everybody seemingly thinks that he abandons them and then comes back and then reunites the family is yeah, that sort but, of and the dad comes back too and the kids are all like Oh, yay! And I'm like, no, fuck Chief Big Tree. He <laughs> sucks. He was gonna fucking abandon... He did abandon you, and he was gonna keep abandoning you if, like, all this traumatic shit didn't happen. I think that, you know, if Kiwi hadn't... Because I think after they get rescued, they all go back to the mainland to see their dad. Um, and they just, like, show up all bedraggled and shit. Like, it's, like, immediate. Like, they get rescued, and then they're like, alright, let's go see dad, because Kiwi knows where he is. They just showed up at his hotel room... And he, he just kind of, like, goes with it, which is why I don't, I don't think that he was ever going to come back. I think he was going to abandon his Busted. Like he Like, he just opened the door and he was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly how I imagined it. Like, I they imagined, got me. like, I imagined, like, the cigarette falling out of his mouth and his eyes bulging, you know, like, it totally seemed like that. Because, you know, his wife fucking died. Like, I don't know. He seems like kind of a shithead. You know, anybody who's going to pretend to be a Native American and train their kids to be alligator wrestlers and homeschool them and keep them secluded on an island, I don't know. I don't know. It doesn't sound great to me. Um, so I guess I was predisposed to not like him, but um, I do really think that he was a fuck and he wasn't going to come back for those kids. 
Yeah, uh, I'm kind of agree with you there, but we pretty much covered everything about this book. I think that's like interesting to talk about so far. Um, Unless you have anything else to add? No, I mean, I just, um, just you know, back to the, back to the whole like, you know, the the rape scene that was really uncomfortable to read and and the whole fallout from that. Like I said, I really wonder if maybe she was really trying to get a point across about like how common that is and how you know, women are, like Laura was saying, you know, it's like any sexual encounters they have are negative and their coming of age stories always involve trauma I, rather than triumph with sex as males do. And I'm like, okay, you know, it's like, if it's in there because it's a reality, I get it, but I do kind of wish that every story wasn't about a girl getting raped. Yeah, can right. I add, like, the extra twisted detail and honestly, like, really good dialogue writing that Karen Russell did is to, uh, immediately after that scene... Uh, the Birdman starts referring to Ava with pet names like Honey and Sweetie, oh, and it's just like yeah. extra, extra Dude, gross. The, the, I mean, the whole interact, like I said, it's just the most perfectly written thing I've ever seen that so accurately portrays this like grooming creep behavior, and even her internal monologue about how she feels like she maybe wanted it, and like all you know, and like oh, I, I'm not gonna tell anyone because I kind of. It was kind of my fault, you know. Like, and it's just pulled well, that's off. That's what you're groomed to do. Yeah, that's what that's what you. <laughs> oh, learned. it was your fault. You went into the woods with some crazy bird man and yeah. brought him back to your. But then again, well, you're raised by people who wrestle alligators for a living. Yeah, you're going like, into the woods with bird man. Yeah, like, normal, all right, right? Th- this is not dangerous. Like, I'm gonna go stick my head in a fucking killing machine's mouth for a minute. <laughs> yeah, like, and and I I yeah. So I mean, I think that the way that was all described, I mean that that's kind of the thing that really sits with me and makes me really love the book. I mean, right down to her description of the, I'm going to say it, the the salmon-colored goo that trickles down her leg. I mean, it's just like, oh, I mean, it should be uncomfortable. Yeah, I mean, you're right. It should be, because it should make people not want to rape kids! God damn it! Yeah, you should, like, look away, like, oh, like, oh, oh, God, oh, that's terrible. Yeah, like, like, uh, Chris, what did you say? You were like, I didn't even want to have sex anymore. (laughs) Yeah, I felt just really bad about that whole, the idea of that for, like, a good four days after. Yeah, it's a tough thing to read, and, I mean, bravo to Karen Russell for writing it, and writing it so well. Most people wouldn't even attempt that. They would just, you know, like, it would be, like, cut to black, you know, whatever. She really does a great job of, I think, especially with that internal monologue, you know, with Ava trying to decide, oh, well, when I, you know, when I put my hand on his leg, did I give him, you know, was that me saying, giving him permission, you know? I mean, it's not explicit, but, you know, you... Because there there are points, you know, as it progresses. Like, Chris was talking about how afterward he starts calling her these pet names. Well, beforehand... She, like, holds his hand a couple times and, like, scooches closer to him when they're in the bow. And, like, she has these these little thoughts that I think kids have with adults. Like, where kids develop, you know, little kids develop crushes on adults. And it's harmless. Um, but it does happen, you know, like... When you're homeschooled, you're, on, yeah, you're right? literally on an island. The people that you're point. around are people that you have constant contact with that doesn't seem weird to hold, you know, someone's hand who you see every single day. Like, right. you, if you don't know how to interact with other people in that kind of a close vicinity, it makes perfect sense that she would, oh, I'm afraid, I'm 13, I'm gonna scooch closer to this person that's giving to me... To this adult who's this giving adult me guidance. This adult who's giving me yeah. guidance. Um, you know, the only other people yeah. I'm guessing that she's really had any contact with are the people coming to the park, right. and they're in and out. She's right. not really building relationships with them, so this 13-year-old girl is left alone with this grown, also weirdo, who's also probably <laughs> got some social yeah. issues if he chases around birds yeah. for a living. Um, yeah. You know, like, yeah. social cues are not necessarily things that either of these two people are going to be terribly strong yeah. with. That's a very good point. Thank you, Laura. That was excellent. Uh, I think that really demonstrates what I was, I guess, what I was trying to say. Um, hey, turns out when you read good books, you have a lot more to talk about. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Um, but what I, one of the things I really like Karen Russell does is, like, she sort of breaks down the magic of the Birdman throughout their journey, um, until finally, after the rape has occurred and Ava sees his, like, cape, um, because, I mean, the whole time, the whole time this is happening, I feel like it's not sunny out, right? It's, like, really shitty and there is Yeah, it's swamp. rainy and so, swampy and gross. So, like, I feel like visibility isn't great. And I think she finally realizes... Um, that the cape is not a magnificent cape of feathers. It's just like 
a fucking rag or something that's got a couple feathers on it. Like, she, you know, it, it's sort of like she starts, and then, like, the bird whistle he has apparently isn't even a bird whistle. It's just, like, hey, you're losing the a magic. shitty whistle. <laughs> right. And, and at the beginning, you know, when she first meets him, oh, he's wearing this beautiful, like, I think, you know, if you've ever seen... Um, the show Game of Thrones, you know, like, the cloaks that the Night's Watch wears, you know, but imagine that with feathers instead of fucking fur, you know, it's like, she talks about it sort of in that way, and then, you know, turns out, no, I, I honestly think the guy is just a crazy swamp man, I don't think he's even employed in birding, um, or anything that he claims, yeah. I, I think he's really just a drifter, um, and I think that he, you know, uh, but he was a smart drifter, I must say, because... He talked to her for a few seconds and and automatically, you know, was like, oh, yeah, the underworld, I'll take you there. I know where that is. So, like, you know he's a fucking predator. Um, or crazy. Or crazy. Or genuinely yeah. thinks he can take her to the underworld. Yeah, well, and that was the other thing that I thought was possible. But then, you know, once once it was obvious that he was going to probably abuse her. I mean, because he, he, like, straight up smacks her in the face in the boat at one point because she tries to, I think, call out to those gator hunters or whatever. Um but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think this was, uh, this is probably our first four star. Like I said, I won't, won't give it, I don't think I'd give it five stars because I do feel like the Kiwi stuff was, eh, kind of not my favorite and the way it ended was kind of, eh, and She I, doesn't I, really have much of a character arc besides, like, becoming a little less isolated in his social socialization. Yeah, and I, I just feel like the story of Ava and Aussie and that whole thing would have been enough. Um, I'm, you know, I am, it, it was kind of, I think she probably had to add all that stuff to make it novel length, because before this, she had written short stories about Ava Big Tree, um, and I think that she wanted to write a novel, so that's why all these things were added, but I really feel it like... Also, the, it also, it really been... helps break up, like, Kiwi's chapters kind of helps break up the mood a little bit. Yeah, it does. I mean, I guess I was I was kind of in it for, like, I just wanted, like, that one mood, but I get that maybe some people don't. Um, I mean, usually it's kind of reversed, as far as, like, the male being the, the plot driver and then females just sort of being these plot points. Yeah, so it's sort true. of like they just turned that on its head and made him just sort of this fluffy character. And yeah. then the, the girls actually get to be the focal point of the story. Right. So it's like, oh, like, you know, sometimes why why is this girl even in this book? Oh, she's a love interest. Like, in this yeah. case, it's like, why is he in this book? Oh, because he's going to find them at the end. Yeah, like, yeah. No, that's a good point. He's a little so, bow to tie everything up. I do think that maybe Karen Russell is a lot more crafty than anybody gave her credit for, and maybe even we gave her credit for initially, because I think we are kind of, through to by talking through this, kind of figuring out what was going on. Um, but yeah, I guess, I don't know, like I said, I'm really torn on the rape thing. It's like, it's it's so well written, and it, and it, and it happens to so many people that maybe that's just reality, but I I don't know. I guess I just want to read more books where it can still be real and not, and, and like a female character doesn't always have to hinge on sexual abuse. Like, I'm just so ugh, so divided on that. But, yeah. But overall a good book, though. Yeah. Maybe a terrible book club first. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, like, I would tell other people to read this. I mean, it, it actually wasn't very long. Um, I So, in an effort to try to speed things up, we're trying a new thing where one of us will have a hard copy and the other will have a Kindle version so that we don't have to, like, literally share the same physical copy because it's what we've been doing and that's why it's really tough for us to put out more than one episode a month. Um, so I, I read it on my Kindle and, like I said, I read it in two days. Like, it was a fast read. I wanted to keep reading it. I gave a shit about the characters. Oh my god, we didn't talk about the little red Seth! Uh, oh, we didn't you never even mention what Seth means oh in, the, in the context god, of this book. So, in, in, oh my god, I can't believe we didn't. Um, in this book, alligators are called Seths. Um, it's like a big tree family thing. They just call them Seths. I have no idea why. It was um, explained early on, but I forgot. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, anyway, like, oh, towards the beginning-ish of the book, Ava, like, after the dad leaves and they're alone, Ava's, like, uh, watching over these um, alligator hatchlings because they also, they breed them and, like, sell off the other ones that they don't keep on the park. Um, and one gets born totally red, which is very unusual. Um, I guess it can happen with the right temperatures or something. And she raises this thing, you know, carries it in her pocket, and she takes it with her, actually, on the journey with the Birdman. And I will tell you, I, oh my god, my eyes almost watered. I was so sad when, <laughs> in an effort to escape from the Birdman after the rape, she throws the... She unbinds the, the little red Seth's 
um, jaws and throws them at the Birdman to try to get away. Oh, I was so sad. I was like, no, you're a little red Seth. What's gonna happen to her? I'm so sad. And, like, even at the end, Ava's like, oh, I wonder if she's still alive. Probably not, though. And I'm like, god damn it, probably not. Aww. <laughs> so sad. I know, they're, they're pretty indestructible. Oh, but she was little, though. She was like... But, you know, it was a baby alligator with poor camouflage, so, like, yeah. if it, it might get caught and eaten by a bigger animal in, like, the first year or so of its life. Yeah, so I was pretty sad that the Red Seth didn't survive, but that kind of makes me like the book more because it wasn't, you know, like a, oh, it's okay. The dog then. didn't live at the end, like. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I'm kind, of, I'm kind of more into stories that are different and not just like, everything's good at the end. It's very you know? European of you. Yes. <laughs> uh, I'm fancy. All right, well, uh, I'm kind of making an effort to try to wrap this up because I have to actually leave oh, yeah, for, like right. real soon, so. Oh, that's right, um, yeah. But if you there's any last points we uh, anyone wants to make about this book, uh, no, I speak just, now. Uh, I just want to thank Laura for being our guest today. Thanks for coming. Yes, by. Please, thank um, you very much for coming by and being a good sport and talking about a book you haven't even read. I know she, she was so great. She she wrote a little synopsis and she told told us about Alligator Farm. It was good. Um, and thank you to Karen Russell for writing a book that was actually really good. I think overall. Um, so I'm gonna go out and buy it. Yeah, read it, you should so. you should read it. It's uh, I got it for the, I got it for free from the library on my Kindle because I'm poor. Um, <laughs> but it's probably not. Yeah, free. speaking of, why don't you contribute to our Patreon? Oh yeah, yeah. You can also help us be less poor and be able to afford more books by contributing to our Patreon. Uh, but uh, there's a, there's some fun stuff we've done in there. We did a deleted scene for or a deleted scene. We did a weird reenactment for one of our patrons. Uh, we also did a whole. We did like a. Uh, Mystery Science Theater 3000 style thing where we watched the Maradonia movie and commented over it so the whole movie and our commentary is also up on the Patreon um, and yeah we'll be producing more content uh, on there soon but um, I think because Chris needs to run to a, prior, a previously scheduled engagement we should probably wrap it up um, so yeah thanks to thank our... you to our patrons uh, there's only one right now it's still Dari <laughs> yeah, thanks. still Dari thanks, thanks still Dari we appreciate <laughs> you no really we do please please keep giving us your money <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah hopefully we'll have more than just Dari to thank next time uh, but that's it for Swaplandia alright uh, bye Paris oh bye Chris bye Chris bye Laura bye Laura <laughs> bye Laura